the theme clearly for the day, this fourth Sunday of Advent. We see this referenced again and again in the lessons before us this morning. The prophet Isaiah, speaking on God's behalf to the king Ahaz. Ahaz caught between the rock of his own nation's military weakness and another's might. To Ahaz, Isaiah says, look, the virgin is with child and shall bear a son and you shall name Emmanuel. And then again in the Gospel of Matthew, the evangelist expands on the same theme, equating the identity of this Emmanuel, this child, with the child born of Mary, and by an adoptive sense, at least by, of Joseph. Joseph, the angel, says to the latter, as he considers the import and the impact of the inconvenient truth revealed to him by his betrothed, the truth about her unforeseen, unexpected pregnancy, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, he saves, the Lord saves. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. And Matthew adds, for us, this means God with us. Well, in a unique way, the Bible makes this claim, this audacious, astounding claim, that in the person of the human Jesus, God is with us in our joys and in our sorrows, in our triumphs and in our tears, in our struggles and in our achievements born in the same manner and after the same fashion as we are, experienced with the same processes of growth and learning, maturity and enlightenment, living our lives, dying our deaths, discovering the love of God which extends beyond the boundaries of life and death. In all of these ways, Jesus became Emmanuel, God with us, God acting intentionally to bridge the gaps and cross the boundaries that exist between us and God, between us and us, between us and the rest of the created order. In Jesus, the Apostle Paul remarks, in Jesus, God bridges those gaps and spans those divides which have been erected and enacted between God and humankind, between heaven and earth, between mine and the human realms, and between life and death itself. In this way, Jesus becomes the means and the method by which God recreates and reestablishes the unity, the commonality which existed on Genesis's seventh day when God rested in creation's completion and took joy and pleasure in the beauty of all that God had fashioned. Sin. Sin divides us from God, divides us from God's perfect will and word and way, divides us from the perfection of creation. Sin separates us as well from one another, isolating us as we come to set ourselves up as individual ids, as isolated centers of self-actualized desire. I liked that phrase. That's why I said it so clearly again. But through Jesus... God saves us from sin through Emmanuel, the God who is with us, takes the initiative to draw us closer to God, closer to one another. Wendell Berry, the southern poet, has a, a wonderful line in the, his poem, The Birth, Near Port William, words that reflect on the sound of the wind as heard by those who stand by while a lamb is being born. It's the old ground trying it again, he writes, solstice, seeding, and birth. It never gets enough. It wants the birth of a man to bring together sky and earth like a stalk of corn. It's not death that makes the dead rise out of the ground, but something alive, straining up, rooted in darkness like a vine. That's what you heard. If you're in the right mind when it happens, it can come on you strong. You might hear music passing in the wind or see a light where there wasn't one before. Music passing in the wind. Light where there was no light before. Light shining in the deepest darkness. Life offered to human beings in the midst of seasons of despair. Hope which is ours not to hold, not to hoard, but to share. Hope given in the face of the world's hopelessness. These are the gifts that come to us at Christmas. Those for which we wait with aching anticipation. Emmanuel, God with us. The New Testament scholar J.B. Phillips, 
who wrote the Phillips translation of the Bible, by the way, and who was active, I believe, in the early part of the 20th century, has written a wonderful fable which describes the incarnation, the presence of God with us in Emmanuel. It's called The Visited Planet, and if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read it to you now. Once upon a time, he says, a very young angel was being shown round the splendors and beauties of the universe by a senior and more experienced angel. To tell the truth, the little angel was beginning to get tired and bored. He had been showed whirling galaxies and blazing suns, infinite distances in the deathly cold of interstellar space, and to his mind there just seemed to be an awful lot of it. Finally, he was shown the galaxy of which our planetary system is a part. And as the two of them drew near to the star that we call the sun and to its circling planets, the senior angel pointed to a small and rather insignificant sphere turning very slowly on its axis. It looked as dull as a dirty tennis ball to the little angel whose mind was filled with the glory of what he had already seen. I want you to watch that one particularly, the senior angel said, pointing with his finger. It, well, it looks very small and rather dirty to me, said the little angel. What's so special about that one? That, replied the senior solemnly, is the visited planet. Visited, said the little one. You don't mean visited by... Indeed, I do. That ball, which I have no doubt looks to you small and insignificant and perhaps not over clean, has been visited by our young Prince of Glory. And at these words, he bowed his head reverently. But how? asked the younger one. Do you mean that our great and glorious Prince, with all these wonders and splendors of creation and millions more that I'm sure I haven't seen yet, went down in person to that fifth-rate little ball? Why would he do a thing like that? It isn't for us, said the senior angel stiffly, to question why, except that I must point out to you that he is not impressed by size and numbers as you seem to, but that he really went, I know, and all of us in heaven who know anything know, as to why he became one of them, how else do you suppose he could visit them? The little angel's face wrinkled in disgust. Do you mean to tell me, he said, that he stooped so low as to become one of those creeping, crawling creatures on that floating ball? I do, and I don't think that he would like you to call them creeping, crawling creatures in that tone of voice, for as strange as it may seem, he loves them. He went down to visit them, to lift them up so that they could become like him. The little angel's face went blank. Such a thought was almost beyond his comprehension. Close your eyes for a moment, said the senior angel, and we will go back in what they call time. While the little angel's eyes were closed and the two of them moved nearer to the spinning ball, its, its spinning spun backwards for quite a while and then slowly resumed its usual rotation. Now, look. And as the little angel did, as he was told, there appeared here or, and there on the dull surface of the globe little flashes of light, some merely momentary, others persisting for a while. What am I seeing now, he asked. You are watching this world as it was some thousands of years ago, replied the older companion. Every flash and glow of light that you see is something of the Father's knowledge and wisdom breaking into the hearts and minds of people who live on this earth. Not many people, you see, can hear his voice or understand what he says, even though he speaks gently and quietly to them all the time. Why are they so blind and deaf and stupid, asked the little one, quite crossly. It's not for us to judge. We who live in the splendor have no idea what it's like to live in the dark. We hear the music and the voice like the sound of many waters every day, but to them there is so much darkness and noise and distraction upon the earth. Only a few who are quiet and humble and wise hear the voice. But watch, for in a moment you will see something truly wonderful. The earth went on turning and circling round the sun, and then quite suddenly in the upper half of the globe there appeared a light, tiny, but so bright in its intensity that both angels hid their eyes. 
I think I can guess, said the little angel in a low voice, that was the visit, wasn't it? Yes, that was the visit. The light himself went down and lived among them, for a, but wait a moment, and you will be able to tell, even with your eyes closed, that the light will go out. But why? Could they not bear, could he not bear their darkness and stupidity? Did he have to return here? No, it wasn't that, the senior angel said in a voice that was both stern and sad. They failed to recognize him for who he was, or at least only a handful knew him. For the most part, they preferred the darkness to the light, and in the end, they killed him. The fools, they don't deserve, neither you, nor I, nor any other angel knows why they were so foolish or wicked. Nor can we say what they do or don't deserve, but the fact remains they killed the Prince of Glory while he was among them. And that, I suppose, was the end. I see the whole earth has gone black and dark. All right, I won't judge them, but surely is that not all they could expect? Wait. Wait, for we are still far from the end of the story of the visited planet. Watch now but be ready to cover your eyes again. In utter blackness, the world turned round three more times, and then there blazed with unbearable radiance a single point of light. What now, asked the little angel, shielding his eyes. They killed him, all right, said the other one, but he conquered death. The thing that most of them dread and fear, he broke and conquered. He rose again, and a few of them saw him, and from then on they became his followers. Thank God for that, the little angel said. Amen, said the other. Open your eyes now, for the dazzling light has gone. The prince has returned to his home here in the splendor, but watch the earth now. And as they looked, in the place of the dazzling light, there was a bright glow which throbbed and pulsated. And then, as the earth changed times, the little points of light began to spread out. A few flickered and died, but for the most part, the lights burned steadily. And as they continued to watch, in many parts of the globe, there was a great glow. You see what is happening, said the elder angel. The bright glow is the company of loyal men and women left behind, and with his help they spread the glow, and now the lights begin to shine all over the earth. Yes, yes, said the little angel impatiently, but how does it all end? Will the little lights join up with each other? Will it all be light as it is here in heaven? The senior angel shook his head. We simply do not know, he replied. It is in the Father's hands. Sometimes it's agony to watch, and sometimes it's joy unspeakable, but the end is not yet. I'm sure that you can see why this little ball is so important. He has visited it and is working out his plan upon it. Yes, said the angel knowingly. Yes, I see, though I still don't understand but I shall never forget that this is the visited planet. Emmanuel, God with us.